just go a few more pages, you'll hit 1 Samuel chapter 2. I was going to say this at the end, but just in case it goes out um, during the sermon, um, I wouldn't want to be a sound and lighting person in a church for anything. They can be up there a thousand Sundays and nothing go wrong, and then some gremlin gets in their equipment in the middle of the week, and everybody knows this. But they do a great job, and we're thankful for them, and appreciate you guys up there. I'm going I'm to give you a hand. And if the mic goes out, I'll just try to be more like Jesus, Brother Jim. So we'll do that. First Samuel chapter 2, as you turn to First Samuel chapter 2, I don't know if you've, you've watched the news this past week, but there's been a church in Kentucky that's been in the news, sort of a media circus around this church. It's called uh, the Cave City Baptist Church, and it's a Southern Baptist church. And the reason why it's been in the media this past week is because they sent out letters to about 70 of their members uh, that said, because you haven't been at church, because you haven't participated in a significant amount of time, we've tried to make contact with you, we're removing your membership from the role of our church. And one of the members of the church took a picture of it. They put it on Facebook. And so it made the rounds around social media and, and the media picked it up. And, and of course, you have both sides of the argument and people are saying, well, how could they do this? And how could they go, go this route? And, and they're just being mean and hateful. And so some people say, well, it's a story of their shut-ins and they, they shouldn't have done this. And the pastor came back and said, no, it's not shut-ins. It's people that haven't been to church in over 20 years and we're trying to get them back in church. Now, what I would say has arisen out of this, the media circus that has come around this, is just a few things, just to remind us today as we get into our sermon, is first of all, you're not saved by your church membership. You can be a member of this church and be as lost as lost can be. So let me say that first of all. You're not saved by your church membership. But second of all, belonging to a local church, participating in a local church, is a mark of a growing and maturing believer. And if, you are not, if you do not belong to a local church, if you're not participating, actively attending a local church, then I have serious questions about your development in Christ. Now, I would say the questions arise out of this because there seems to be a tendency among cultural Christianity in the United States to spurn God's grace. Now, what do I mean by spurning God's grace? I mean that people, cultural Christians in the United States today, tend to have a tendency to be really, really excited about not going to hell. I've got Jesus. I don't have to spend eternity in damnation. That's good. But now I'm going to live any way that I want to live. I'm going to do anything I want to do because they got excited about not going to hell and they never learned what it was like to love God. That's what I mean by spurning grace. And I think that is exactly what you see in our passage today in 1 Samuel chapter 2. You see a family, at least two sons, that spurned the grace of God. They liked all the benefits of claiming to know God. They liked all the benefits that seemed to come along with, with knowing about who God is. But when it came down to it, they spurned the grace of God and did not know God himself. So when we come to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, we pick up this story. We see a story now of two families. We've been following along with one, one family, a very domesticated family, in the time, a period of the judges. And we, we see this lady named Hannah who has prayed for a son. She has given her son Samuel to the Lord to serve all the days of his life. She sings this beautiful song in the first 11 verses that we looked at last week and essentially tells us that God opposes the proud, but it gives grace to the humble. And so you would think after the highlight of this story in the first 11 verses, that if God opposes the proud and uh, gives grace to the humble, that we would expect a story right after that to see that taking place. We would see God's enemies being, being taken down. We see God's uh, grace be, being given to those that humble before him. But we see the exact opposite. Instead of seeing the story of God's enemies, we see a problem in God's house itself. And we see why people during the day of Israel did what was right in their own eyes. So we pick up the story of this priest named Eli who is serving at the tabernacle in Shiloh. And we find out about his sons. Read with me 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. 
The writer goes on to, to show us why they were worthless and did not know the Lord, that they would steal from the offering, that they would use force to get choice meats that they want, wanted. And he tells us in verse 17, Thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord, for the men treated the offering of the Lord with contempt. And then goes on to explain what their father would do about it in verse 22. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all of Israel, and how they lay with women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all these people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the, the, of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and favor with the Lord and also with man. And so God responds and sends a prophet to, to, to tell them in verse 27 what's going to take place. And there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, Thus says the Lord, Did I indeed reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt subject to the house of Pharaoh? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire and from the people of Israel. Why then do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings that I commanded for my dwelling and honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest part of every offering of the people of Israel? Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel declares, I promise that your house and the house of your father should go in and out before me forever. But now the Lord declares, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Now just place your finger there. We'll come back in just a moment. We see this story from the very beginning that they are rejecting God's grace and confirming their own judgment upon themselves. We read the story of Eli. Now, Eli uh, was the priest that was serving at Shiloh at this time. You may remember him from chapter 1 when Hannah goes into uh, to the tabernacle of Shiloh to pray for a son. Eli is the one that confronts her and says, Why are you a worthless woman who is here drunk doing these things? And Hannah reminds Eli in, in chapter 1, I am not a worthless woman. I am here praying to God. Now the reason why that is important is because this word worthless has a very specific meaning. The word, the translation, some of your translations even may translate it as Belial. Belial means a very terrible understanding of Scripture. We see it with Hannah in chapter 1. The last time we saw it in Scripture was in Judges chapter 19, verse 22, to describe a horrendous act in which a bunch of men violated one woman. Christ, Paul will say this of Jesus, what association does Christ have with Belial in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 15? It is a description that when it says in verse 12, now the sons of Eli were worthless men, so they, they were sons of Belial, it is a character of destruction and wickedness and rebellion. They did not know the Lord, is what verse 12 tells us. You just have to scratch your head and say, how is this the case? How is it that they did not live a holy life? They were, these were the guys that, that were serving in the, in the tabernacle, were serving before the Lord. How in the world did they get to be this way, that they were characterized? If you were to say, how do you describe the sons of Eli? They're characterized by their destructed, destruction and wickedness and rebellion. Just go and look at what they did. They stole meat in verse 16. They, go, they would go out. They were allowed to get their food from the stew pots that were offered there. They would stick in a giant fork, and whatever came out, that's what they would eat. But they didn't like stew meat. They wanted the choicest of meats. And so what they would do is they would send out their thugs, and by force they would take the meat raw. And we read about this in verse 16. And if a man said to him, let them burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish, he would say, no, you must give it now, and if not, I will take it by force. In other words, they would send out their thugs and say, give me the best of the best that is resigned for God, that is supposed to be left for God, according to Leviticus chapter 7, verse 31, that's supposed to be designated for God. And if you didn't give it to them, they became greedy bullies and they used their privilege and power to take what they wanted. Now, God had provided for them. There was uh, provision in the Levitical law for them to be able to eat. They were supposed to be given the breast of the animal. They were supposed to be given the right thigh of the animal to eat. But that here they were stealing meat from the Lord. Not only did they steal meat, but they also abused women. We read this about this in verse 22. 
that there was a group of women. Now, this is potentially, they or were either women who had taken a Nazarite vow that were there serving in the tabernacle, or they were volunteers who were serving in the tabernacle uh, to make sure that it was clean, make sure that things were taken care of, things that were done that needed to be done. And these women that were serving in this way, they would abuse them. And in this place where sin should have been confessed, sin was committed in a heinous way. No wonder Scripture calls them Eli's worthless sons. And Eli gives them a worthless rebuke. Read with me in verse 23. Verse 22 says, Now Eli was very old. We have to wonder if we have that description because is it telling us that Eli was old when this took place because he waited until his kids were grown to offer any discipline or any rebuke for them? Or is it reminding us that Eli was very old because of the judgment that was about to come? Eli asked them why they were doing this and says, everybody in Israel knows this. Everybody knows what you're doing. He asked them verse 23 and 24. says, Who, we, we all, everybody knows what's taking place. And yet he does nothing about it. Eli, it was within his power to fire his sons, to kick them out of the tabernacle. And yet he chooses to honor his sons above God. Now I want to take just a moment here and talk about uh, parenting, and particularly with Eli's parenting. We deal with this issue of what seems to be worthless kids. Now I will say, one of the, one of the great difficulties I deal with as a pastor And talking to parents of grown children, particularly later baby boomers who have older kids. A lot of you later baby boomers are dealing with older kids that appear to be worthless, that appear not to be doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. Now, I will say this. It is fully possible to do all the things right as a parent and still have your kids rebel. Samuel himself is going to experience this in chapter 8. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, Samuel has been a prophet of the Lord, and his own sons grow up to rebel against God. It is possible to do all things right and still have your children rebel against God. That is because the greatest problem in your kid's life is the sin that is in their heart. And as a parent, you are unable to change that. Only Jesus Christ can change their hearts. So it is possible to do all things right and still have grown children that grow up and rebel against the Lord. However, it is also possible that you as a parent choose not to honor the Lord and so that the next generation forgets the Lord altogether. So I just want to say, if you're in Eli's situation, my heart breaks for you, and I know this is easy for me to say because all my kids are little. I'll be honest with you. I love the fact right now that if my kids don't do something that I want them to do right now, I'll be like, go to your room. I'm going to give you a spanking. I'm not looking forward to the day where they're grown adults, and I no longer have that power over them. But I will say this. If you are a parent of a grown child who is not following the Lord, redeem the time. Pray for your kids. Pray that God's grace would break into their heart. Proclaim the gospel to them. Teach them about Jesus Christ. We believe that there is hope in the gospel. But parents of small children particularly, if you choose not to honor the Lord, don't be surprised when the next generation forgets him altogether. So Eli reminds him of this very true statement in verse 25. If someone sins against a man... God will mediate for him, but if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? This is very, very true. For us to sin against another man, those, those sins can be atoned, atoned for. Those sins can be taken care of by the Lord. But if we reject God, if we reject the very means of grace, if we, if we reject what God has done, the only thing we can face is condemnation. This is what Jesus will describe as blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. To reject God himself is to reject all hopes of salvation. Notice what takes place here. We have to read very carefully in verse 25. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father. Now my translation says for... But you can also translate that, that, Hebrew, that Hebrew phrase as because, because it is the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now, if we read that hastily, if we read that quickly in verse 25, we would read it as this, that, that uh, Phineas and Hophni, 
rebelled and were wicked against the Lord, and because of the rebellion, God decided to put them to death. That we can read it, their resistance as being the rationale for their judgment instead of the result of their judgment. But that is not what this verse says. What this verse says is that the result of their judgment is that they were unable to listen to the rebuke of their father. What seems to take place here is because, what seems to take place is they rebelled against God and God confirmed their rebellion and they were unable to listen to the rebuke of their father. Now, if we listen to this as a critic, we look at God and say, well, God, perhaps you are deficient in some way in mercy. We would, we would look at God and we would prosecute God on this account. God, what do you mean? You're supposed to be a God of love and grace and mercy. How could you not let them listen? How could you not let them return? And we would accuse God of being deficient in some way of mercy and grace. Let me just remind you, this is the the question that we often think about in connection with this. How could God let an innocent person who's never heard the gospel die and go to hell? Well, first of, first of all, there are no innocent people. Every single person is guilty of sin. There are no innocent people on this planet. And second of all, that's not the question we should be asking in the first place. The question we should ask in the first place is, how in the world can a holy and righteous God save anyone at all? How in the world could God ever even save me? And so we want to look at this as a critic and say, God, you're deficient in your mercy. You're, you're lacking in your mercy in somehow. And yet we ought to instead marvel that he has grace and mercy at all. Or if we don't look at it as a critic, we look at it curiously. Some of us want to look at this curiously and look at it and say, well, what, at what point does this happen? At what point do I get too far? At what point does my heart become too hard? So at what point do my sins become so great that I, my heart becomes so hard that I'm unable to, to respond or unable to repent or unable to listen? Well, at what point does God confirm me in my sin? And so we look at this curiously and we start to do math and we start to add it up and say, at what point does this become the case? I would say to you this morning, that both the critic and the curious look at this passage wrongly. The point of this verse is not to be a critic of God's mercy, and the point of this verse is not to be curious about at what point does this happen. The point of this verse is to tremble before a holy God. To be able to look at this and say, God is that holy and takes sin that seriously that you and I ought to tremble and stand in awe before him. And yet this is the case. So God sends his judgment upon the family of Eli. In verse 27, there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, and and tells him and uh, gives him the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. And he reminds them in this judgment of all the gracious things that God has done. Look at, look at all the things he says here in verse 27. Did I indeed reveal myself? You're under, you understand that this is a, a gracious act of God. Scripture teaches us two things. It is impossible to know God unless God chooses to reveal himself. But thankfully, the second thing is that Scripture teaches us is that God has chosen to reveal himself through his word and through his son, Jesus Christ. That is a gracious act of God upon us to even show us that he exists, to even reveal himself at all. He reminds them of their grace. Did I not reveal myself to your father when you were in Egypt, subject to the house of Israel? The second gracious act, verse 28, did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my own priest, to go up to the altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod uh, before me? Another act of grace. In verse 28, did I not choose, did I not move and act to save your people and to make it possible for you to know me? The second act of grace. Not only that, he tells them at the end of verse 28, I gave to the house of your father all my offerings by fire. The, God's reminding them, say, was I not gracious in providing all the needs that you, that you have? God is saying, look, I have given you all of this grace. I have done all of these things for you. I, why have you spurned my grace in such a way? This is God reminding them that God's grace does not nullify holiness in our life. Paul will say this in the New Testament in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, in relation to the grace of God and us living a holy life. He says this, What shall we say then, Romans 6, 1? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? 
The words of Paul in Romans 6, 1 and 2. This is what God is reminding him in 1 Samuel chapter 2. That you sh- you've known all the grace. You've known all the things I've done for you. And yet you've spurned my grace. These are the words that the, the, the prophet uses to them. Why are you spurning these things that I do? They were only required to do three things. They were only required to ascend to the Lord's altar. In Exodus chapter 28, verse 43, we have this description of the priests ascending the Lord's offer, representing the people of Israel before God. They were supposed to burn incense. Exodus chapter 30, verse 7, they're supposed to wear an ephod that had two onyx stones on it. They had the names of the 12 tribes. Their job as priests was to represent all of Israel as intermediaries between Israel and God, to provide the sin, the sin sacrifice, to provide the offering, to, inter, to intercede on behalf of the people of Israel. And yet we see disaster for God's people. The priests themselves who are supposed to do these things are so full of sin. There seems to be no hope whatsoever. This is a word of judgment upon them. That's a great sermon. Let's all go home. You encouraged today? You may have noticed I skipped over a few verses. That was intentional. Because what I wanted to show you is this, that God's judgment confirms us, is confirmed upon ourselves and our sins for rejecting His grace. But God establishes His grace through His faithful priest. You see, in the midst of this disaster, in the midst of this terrible outworking of what is taking place, God is working in the background to save his people. Go back and reread with me through these passages. Now, if you were to read this straight through, you would think that the author was sort of schizophrenic going back and forth, but it is intentional. You get this description of Eli's worthless sons in verse 12 through 17, and then you get this little inter- interlude in verse 18. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy clothed with a linen ephod, and his mother used to make, him, make for him a little robe and take to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. Indeed, the Lord visited Hannah and she conceived and bore three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. And then in verse 22 through 25, you get this description of Eli's wicked sons. But then in verse 26, you get this. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. Then in verse 27, you go back to the description of the judgment and what is taking place in Eli's house all the way down to verse 33 where God promises to kill the descendants of Eli. In verse 34. But then you get verse 35. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall go in and out before my anointed forever. And everyone who is left in your house shall come to implore him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread, and shall say, Please put me in one of these priests' places that I may eat a morsel of bread. Interspersed throughout this entire passage, you have Eli's wicked family, and then a reminder that Samuel's there. It's like in verse 18, the writer goes, hey, yeah, don't forget about Samuel. Verse 21, hey, yeah, don't forget about Samuel. Verse 26, hey, yeah, don't forget about Samuel. Matter of fact, in the description in verse 26, that Samuel continued to grow both in stature and favor with the Lord, if you have ears on, that ought to sound familiar. It is the exact same description that is given of Jesus in Luke chapter 2, verse 52. It is almost as if the author, the writer, the Holy Spirit wants to remind us, don't forget about the quiet working of God. That when evil seems to reign, when sin seems to to rule, that there is a hope and a quietness in the mundane steady growth of God's faithful service. This is what God is doing in the background. He is raising up in the midst of this wickedness, he is raising up Samuel to serve faithfully. But then we get this interesting passage here in verse 35. 
it tells us that God will raise up for himself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in his heart and in his mind, and he will build him a sure house, and he shall go on in and out before my anointed forever. And so we ask, well, this is not Eli's family, because it's just told us in verse 32, 33, 34, that he's going to cut off Eli's family. He's going to kill all of his descendants. And that happens in 1 Samuel chapter 22. Saul is chasing after David. Eli's descendants help David. And so Saul gets Doag, the Edomite, to go out and kill 85 of Eli's descendants. The only one that lives out of Eli's family is Abathar. And then later on, Abathar is thrown out by, King, uh, by Solomon. And a guy named Zadok takes his place. So it's not Eli's family that's going to be the priest. And it's not Samuel. We're in Samuel, we're told, he, he's wearing this linen ephod. He, he does these priestly things. But then at the very beginning of chapter 3, we pick up Samuel as a prophet par excellence. And Samuel one day dies. And it's not Zadok. When all of Eli's family dies, and Abathar is kicked out in 1 Kings chapter 2, the priestly line of Zadok rises up. And Zadok's line rules until the exile in Babylon. So it's not Eli's family, it's not Samuel's family, and it's not Zadok's family. And there's even some today that would say that it's the Pope. Some today consider the Pope to be the vicar of Christ, the the interceding priest here on earth. But here's the sad reality about every single Pope that will live. Every single Pope that lives will die one day. None of them will reign and rule forever. And none of them have access to a treasury of merit And none of them can intercede on your behalf. So it's not Samuel, and it's not Eli's family, and it's not Zadok, and every single pope that has ever lived will never meet the qualifications of 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35. So who in the world does God raise up to be our priest, to intercede on our behalf for all of eternity? Who is it that meets the description of verse 35? It can be none other than Jesus Christ. The writer of Hebrews reminds us of this in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than the one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. But then he goes on to say this in verse 23. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he who holds this priesthood permanently because he continues forever... Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Did you hear that? Do I need to read it again? He always lives to make intercession for them. Let me tell you today, we have a good and great priest who does not take from his people, but he gives to his people. We have a good and great priest that intercedes upon our behalf, who died once and for all for the sins of his people. Matter of fact, in just a few minutes, we're going to remember that sacrifice. Now, let me tell you the great news about the Lord's Supper. When we take the Lord's Supper, it's just juice and it's just bread. There is nothing that changes. There's nothing that transforms. That's because Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. He paid it all once. And now he intercedes as our faithful priest in heaven on our behalf. And so when we take the Lord's Supper, we remember that his blood was spilt. We remember that his body was broken on our behalf. We remember that he is alive today. And he sits on his throne. And he intercedes on our behalf. I used to, when I was a younger Christian, I used to picture this in heaven. Uh, A long time ago, I'd picture that I would sin. I'd go to God in prayer. And Jesus would sort of look at me and go, yeah, I'll forgive you one more time. That's not the way that it takes place. Here's the way that it takes place. Jesus is my intercessor. He is my priest. He is my faithful, eternal priest standing before God. Here's the way it takes place. I come before God with nothing but sin in my hands. And Jesus says, I've got it taken care of. I've paid it all. I've paid it all for this one. Dear unbeliever, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, 
if you reject Jesus, you spurn the grace of God, and there is no hope for you. Your only hope is Jesus. If you reject Jesus Christ, who will intercede for you? Today, if you don't know him, don't reject Jesus. Let today be the day that you repent of your sins and you trust in Christ. Don't be like the critic that accuses God of being deficient in mercy. Don't be like the curious and wonders how long you can get away with it. Trust Jesus and trust him today. Dear believer, church, this passage ought to at least cause us to ask this question. Do we have a problem in our church? Do we as people who hold the grace of Jesus Christ hold holiness in contempt? Are we so glad that we don't have to go to hell anymore but haven't realized how to love God? Are we so glad that we get the benefits of the kingdom but don't realize that the greatness of heaven is not the benefits. The greatness of heaven is that's where Jesus is. Church, Today, if we are like Phineas and Hophni, if we are like Eli's worthless sons, let us repent of our sins and understand that God's great grace calls us to more holiness, not less. And let us trust the mercy and grace of God alone through Jesus Christ alone. Would you pray with me?